actually. We're going to restart uh, our panel uh, with our third speaker, Azra Talat, Talat Sayed. Azra works with Roots for Equity, an organization that remains committed to being part of communities struggling for social and economic justice. Azra is an activist working for farmers' rights and women's rights. She is the chairperson for International Women's Alliance and the vice chair of the International League of People's Struggles. So please join me in welcoming Azra, and she has a set of slides that she will be using in her talk. Hello, can you get the presentation started? Thank you. Oh, it did, okay. Um, so what I've done is I've also put the, what I'm going to be saying on the screen so it's easy for people to follow, but uh, I wonder how am I going to do that because I will have to turn around. So what I'm going to present is very close to what uh, Dr. Friedman just talked about, and that's livestock. In Pakistan, where, I, where a country where I live and I work with peasants, there is a huge attack on the lives and livelihoods of peasants, especially in the context of livestock. And I will try and present that, how critical, as Dr. Harriet has already explained, livestock is part and parcel of the biodiversity which is essential for our lives in many, many different ways. In the past years, since the formation of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, there has been an attack, a vicious attack on seeds, which are the very base of life. And now the second attack is on livestock, which actually is part and parcel of our planet. The planet which provides us with food is based on all genetic resources, and that's what is driving this greed from the capitalist economy. So I will start. Maybe it'll be easier for me to read from here. Okay, so in Pakistan, the Global Hunger Index has ranked Pakistan 99 out of 116 nations. It has been slated as suffering from serious degree of hunger currently. There is severe, uh, there is severe food price inflation at the moment, and it has been in the double digits for the past three to four years. The cost of food has been 10 to 19% higher than the previous year in urban areas and 12 to 23% in rural areas. The food crisis is the manifestation of not only the Ukraine war, but also a result of the severe climate crisis faced by the country. Many of you would know there was a huge flood last year. It was known as monster monsoon. In the past months, there have been many in the past months, there have been many instances of food stampedes as people wait in long lines to access free or subsidized wheat flour. With more than seven people killed in just, and the numbers have gone up since I wrote this last week. With more than, um, I think it's about 12 people have been killed, including women. There are already protests on the ground at the brutal fo uh, police force being used at these flower distribution points. In addition, the country has extremely depleted foreign exchange reserves and is reeling under the astronomical debt of approximately 126 billion American dollars. No doubt, the current food, climate, and economic crisis in the country can be linked to the semi-colonial, semi-feudal mode of production, which we see in Pakistan. Under this framework, a small bureaucratic elite continued to develop and implement policies that cater to the self-interest of the small, powerful minority class of local elite and the highly industrialized capitalist class of imperialist nations, of which, of course, Germany is one. Okay. Having made this statement, it certainly needs further clarification. The main source of wealth in an, in, in an agrarian economy is, of course, land. According to Government of Pakistan data, in 1947, when we came out from the British colonialism, 
and there was a transfer of, Pakistan, uh, transfer of power to the Pakistani elite. Only 7% of landowners owned 53% of land. In 2013, according to government data, now 5% of agriculture households own 64% of farmland. In short, instead of lessening of land concentration, it has increased. In essence, 36% of land is held by 95% of farmers, small farmers, of which 80% of small farmers own less than five acres of land, and women have less than 2% of land. So although no concrete figures are available, a second intensely, intensely critical player is the Pakistan army, which has vast load land holdings. Just in the past month, uh, 45,000 acres of land had been handed over by the government to the military for overseeing corporate agriculture. And one has to ask, is the army there to do agriculture or defend our boundaries, of which it does a very poor job? So, However powerful the local elite are, imperialist powers, especially the United States, has had a deeper political and economic control of the country. This is especially so for food and agriculture. Apart from directive, direct policy directives from the United States state, capitalist institutions such as the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization have played a critical, disastrous impact on policy development and implementation, generally and especially in agriculture. So let me quote a US senator, Senator, senator Rupert Humphrey, who in 1957 stated the following, I have heard that people may become dependent on us for food. I know that was not supposed to be good news. To me, that was good news because before people can do anything, they have to eat. And if you are looking for a way to get people to lean on you, to be dependent on you in terms of their cooperation with you, it seems to me that food dependence would be terrific. So it just shows you the, the mindset of imperialist nations. It was with this mindset that the Green Revolution technologies were introduced in the neo-colonial countries, including Pakistan. With land under control of feudal lords, a country under military dictatorship of President General Ayub Khan, Green Revolution was imposed, which Dr. Harriet just talked about, was imposed by force, replacing indigenous seeds with high-yielding varieties, especially for staple crops for wheat, rice, and maize. More than 60 years of intense use of chemical fertilizers and very toxic pesticides have basically wiped out all indigenous seeds for grains and vegetables and has harmed biodiversity intensely. The most common example cited by local people is of honeybees that are now rarely seen. And pure honey is a very expensive, precious commodity. The constant land grabbing, especially by the powerful political players in real estate, including the military, have destroyed large tracts of mangrove forests that are intensely critical for saving our fisher for communities, for livelihood, for saving fauna and flora, and is a source of fresh oxygen for cities like Karachi, which have more than 20 million people living in it, and for mitigating climate change. But that is certainly not happening. So with the formation of the World Trade Organization in 1995, it subjected the agriculture sector to a binding set of agreements for the first time. Critical WTO agreements, such as the Agreement on Agriculture, also known as AOA, generally amongst activists, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, the TRIPS agreement, which is so detrimental, were a vicious attack. Sorry, huh? I'm very sorry. Uh, were a vicious attack on farmers especially small and landless farmers. Neoliberal policies, not only through the WTO, but structural adjustment programs of the IMF and the World Bank, based on deregulation, privatization, and liberalization, were unleashed on the very poor 
subsistence, subsistence farmers in neo-colonial countries. Of course, Pakistan. TRIPS agreement became the basis for the adoption of the Pakistan Seeds Amendment Act, the Plant Breeders' Rights Act, and has paved the way for selective sale and planting of genetically modified seeds. And we don't need to add that privatization of the seed sector has been carried out on the behest of the World Bank. Um, this is based on the government data again. In, two, in 2008, an alliance of small and landless farmers called Pakistan Kisan Mazdoor Tehreek, PKMT, was formed as a response to the liberalization of food and agriculture. The 14 years of struggle by the landless farmers have been marked by many ups and downs, especially in the context of increasing membership of landless women. And agriculture's from religious minorities, the Hindus and the Christians, which are a very small minority in Pakistan. Pakistan is based on Islam. The extremist religious tendencies have seen a sharp rise in the 1980s after the support of the United States. In the Afghan war in the 1980s by our, one of the worst dictators in the history of our country, but I think in the world maybe, General Ziaul Haq's regime. The impact on women's lives, their mobility, and public participation has been sharply curtailed and has had a crippling effect on women's liberation in the country, especially in rural environments. Another aspect of Islamization has been that in 1989, a Shariat appellate bench of the Supreme Court declared land reforms in Pakistan as un-Islamic. How convenient. PKMT has had to struggle for food sovereignty in such a regressive political and economic environment unleashed by forces of neoliberalism and religious, religious fanaticism that are in, in essence two sides of the same coin, imperialism. In order to hold its mass, in order to hold a build, uh, build its mass among the peasantry, PKMT's key strategy has been to launch consistent nationwide political education programs discussing neoliberalism's impact on the lives and livelihood of the peasantry. The programs range from village to provincial to national political act activist trainings that include segregated village-based programs with women and young girls. A particular case study is being di discussed here that will focus on class and patriarchal elements of a society and their impact on biodiversity. So I will particularly talk about um, what is happening in the dairy and livestock sector. Let me uh, just say this, that more than 90% of livestock is reared and looked after by women across the country, all four provinces. And so when they attack livestock, you actually attack women's access to food, access to income, access to fuel, access to animals, and it's, it's a massacre. Pakistan is based in a land which has a history as old as 5,000 years. It is home to Mehergarh, which is about 7,000 BCE, the Indus Valley Civilization, and Harappa. Our genetic resources have evolved, have evolved through these millennia. Small and landless farmers with women in the forefront, through their back-breaking labor, Traditional practices and indigenous knowledge have played a key role in conserving local and in indigenous livestock breeds, as well as evolving seeds, the very base of biodiversity. It is in this backdrop that Pakistan proudly claims to be the fourth largest milk producer in the world. But now dairy, transnational corporations have initiated a vicious attack on the livestock sector in Pakistan. The base continues to be the World Trade Organization's agreement, especially the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement and the technical barriers to trade agreement. Through the use of the Codex Elementarius, which is a body in the, in the Food and Agriculture Organization part of the UN. FAO sets food safety and animal and plant health standards. In this context, the government in all provinces has set up food authorities, passing the pure food 
uh, regulations, especially the food regulations of 2018, to impose various restrictions on the production, processing, and sale of food. Punjab and Sindh, two of the major provinces of the country, uh, so Punjab and pure, uh, Sindh Pure Food Authorities have issued orders that fresh, natural, open milk cannot be sold and can be sold only after pasteurization. For businesses that are producing milk and other milk products have to undergo a complex process of registration with the government authorities to be able to operate in the dairy sector. These homogenizing rules and processes are the direct result of globalized, industrialized approach to food production that allows only large commercial sectors to remain viable in the face of highly technical, expensive regula regulatory standards. At the moment, at least 90% of milk sales is from small producers, with Punjab accounting for almost 70% of the livestock and agriculture sector. It is well understood that almost 90% of livestock care is in the hands of landless rural women across the country. And ordinary rural households earn 35 to 40% of their income from livestock. In addition, animal dung is a critical product needed for compost preparation, soil fertility, as well as fuel for household needs. Hence, sanitary and phytosanitary measures has taken on a critical importance for landless women farmers. The transnational dairy corporations fully understand not only the lucrative market that milk and a range of value-added dairy products, such as butter, cheese, cream, yogurt, buttermilk, implies. Pakistan has some of the best cows and buffalo species that yield rich, creamy milk, with some very good breeds among cows include Sahiwal, Red Sindhi, Tharparkar, Haryana, Kankaraj, Gir, and Angol, all originating from Pakistan. European, US, and Australian companies want to replace these with their hybrid animals, who though are highly productive, they give 40 liters of milk per day, which is not drinkable. And um, so they have these hybrid animals who are highly productive in milk quantity, but have very poor quality of milk. These corporations have been in the forefront of trying to wrench control of livestock and dairy from the small farmers, from the landless farmers, not only in Pakistan, in, but in many of the new colonial countries. There is now an important, there is now an importation of live cattle, including Holstein, Frisian cows. I don't know if you guys have seen it. I'm sure you have. You live in Europe. Big fat cows, you know, as long as this room. And uh, semen, including semen, for animal breeding, as well as imported varieties of fodder and fodder seed is being promoted in the Pakistani market. So it's a whole range of market products. It's not only the animals. As has been stated earlier, a very large majority of farmers in the country do not own land. Most landless will lease land for growing fodder. The onslaught of open market policies has increased the land lease sky high. It's going up almost daily as well as the cost of agriculture production is driving more and more farmers into debt, ultimately driving them off land. Once farmers cannot afford to lease land, they will have to sell their animals as feeding them through the market purchase fodder is simply not affordable. It's like eating out every day, which most of us in, in our countries, we cannot afford to eat out every day. So uh, what PKMT has done, once PKMT understood the politics behind the pure food authorities, there is a problem. You can't speak fast. <laughs> you have to go. It's OK. Uh, that's our world, no? It's OK. Once PKMT understood the politics behind the food, pure food authorities restricting the sale of milk in the open market, the issue was taken up with women farmers in Sahiwal district, which is the most well-known area for one of the best cows that we have. Uh, women farmers were initially organized in Sahiwal, and then the issue was taken up across the country with not only women, but all farmers, including consumer groups, urban milk sellers, and other public forums. Mm -hmm. A broad six-month campaign on safe and nutritious food was launched last year 
This year, on March 8th, just last month, a three-month campaign was launched titled Save Our Invaluable Rural Assets, Campaign Against Corporate Capture of Dairy and Livestock Sector. The campaign includes radio messages, TV programs, podcasts, rallies, press conferences, and so on. For reaching the masses, more than 500,000 pamphlets are being distributed by, foot, by farmers from one area to the other at public points such as transport centers, local bazaars, and so on. So you can see just yesterday this came. They're destroying milk. You know, for us, this is the month of Ramadan. And how dare they destroy milk when people are going hungry? So there is a clear divide in society. The understanding that genetic resources are critical pillars of health safety, health safe ecological systems, as well as a critical makeup of rural communities, food and livelihood source is absent. The issue of health and hygiene in the context of milk is also very gentrified, given over to the capitalist science. The Pakistan Medical Association is fully supporting the call for milk pasteurization, with no understanding that such a move will basically put the entire production, distribution, and sale of milk into the hands of the dairy sector corporate giants, such as Nestle. Recently, one of the biggest lo local dairy corporations was bought by a French corporation called Friesland Campina, it makes no difference to educated professional classes that 80% of the country has no access to clean water and are fully falling victims to the intense print and electronic media propaganda being propagated by uh, corporations. On a discussion with some of the Pakistan Medical Association members, it was clear they had been taken on tours to dairy corporations, cattle farms, and so on. Uh, for them, milk adulteration carried out by milkmen must be stopped. For them, milk, uh, and, and the way to do so was to hand it over to the industrialist who will invest the money in the country. So it's actually two very powerful lobbies feeding each other. <clears throat> that other approaches to safeguarding people's health and nutrition, especially for women and young children, is not part of that discourse. So while women and young girls are living under very anemic conditions, uh, it, this is widely discussed. And you know how these urban people will say, oh, it's so bad, you know, tucked it over the understanding that whole milk is a complete nutritious diet for women and young girls, is more accessible for rural communities if they have milk animals, is not fully comprehended. So there's a huge class divide, and there is an urban-rural divide, which I think Dr. also talked about. Once milk and dairy products are in the hands of the profit-hungry corporate sector, the entire working class and rural communities will be unable to access this product. The imperialist control over economic resources and the intense harm to the natural environment, climate crisis, and the context of climate imperialism is missing from debates, discussions, and advocacy. Unfortunately, feminist politics is also, by and large, on liberal grounds, most often based on very simplistic understandings of human rights, with advocacy centering on social issues of patriarchy, emphasizing violence against women. The common class difference, urban-rural divide, is highly polarized, and issues faced by rural women is uh, very vaguely understood. I would like to finish by touching on the intense climate crisis faced by Pakistan, Pakistan has more than 7,000 glaciers sitting on its top. This, it has the largest number of glaciers after the Arctic poles. It has contributed less than 1% to global carbon emissions, yet it is one of the 10 most vulnerable countries suffering from climate change. The recent floods restricted, resulted in the loss of more than a million livestock, with further popularization of the rural communities, especially in Sindh. Just last month, there were hailstorms that also destroyed considerable amount of almost ready to harvest wheat crops. Despite Pakistan being ranked at eighth in producing wheat, 10th in rice, fifth in sugarcane, fourth in milk, 
A 2019 report of the State Bank of Pakistan showed that nearly 37% of households have, are food insecure, and the situation from 2019 to now, given COVID, um, what was it called? COVID-19 has happened, and there was a very bad flood last year, which destroyed not only wheat, it also destroyed rice. So most of the major food crops were dis destroyed. Even under this uh, such vast destruction, the IMF continues to impose inhumane loan conditions just now. So, however, I will just finish with this. It is these very conditions that give impetus to struggles like those being mounted by the Pakistan Kisan Mazdoor Tariq and other militant organizations across the world. To increase women militant struggles, develop militant people's armies, to build solidarity among struggling com communities and movements, and to fight for natural liberation is the only way to overcome the semi-feudal, semi-colonial mode of production. Thank you.